And now, it's time for the Lakeside Drive F1 podcast. Here are your hosts and my supreme leaders, James Baldwin, Campy, and Freya Brolsma. Hello and welcome to Lakeside Drive. Once again, Fernando Alonso is going to be the driver to kick. The driver market dominoes falling all over the place. And we learn that Australia is officially the season opener for 2025. All of that to come in this episode, as well as our preview of the Chinese Grand Prix. There is a notable absence from today's episode, one Thomas J. Camp. And Good. as we do start thinking about the Chinese Grand Prix, I can't help but think it might be deliberate. But Wonder joining why. me today is James Baldwin. James, how are you? And have you been in any paddocks this week? Hello. No. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I've not. Uh, thank goodness for that. Uh, just to avoid the joke for one more week. Um, although we won't be thinking about it next week because that won't this, time, stop us. <laughs> this time next week, uh, you won't be here either because you'll have been in London. Uh, yeah, you would have, by this point, I imagine, finished. No, not by this point. Tomorrow, by this point, you would have finished uh, many, many, many kilometres, a full race distance almost uh, of your own London marathon. That is true. So we were just talking about it earlier and trying to figure out these time zones is a bit of a mess. But mm. uh, roughly as the... Checkered flag falls, my lights will go out. So, mm. not the flag, literally, not literally, but the. Uh... <laughs> I will have knocked myself out on a flagpole. I hope that there are still light. There's still light in my eyes, <laughs> but uh, my lights out and away we go. Uh, we'll we'll be going lighting. Um, yes. Both. I start as the Chinese Grand Prix finishes is what I mean to say mm. in the midst of all of those words. Can I can I also just say the notable absence of Thomas J. Camp is <laughs> yes. twofold. Firstly, he, he just didn't bring his podcasting gear to where he was going. So that tells you everything you need to know about that man. Secondly, he went to Incubus twice, I think. Um, so he yeah. and four others <laughs> went to the band Incubus. Um, Never to be seen again. <laughs> and uh, fantastic. I mean, he was standing up the very back, I think. It looked like the forum or something of a venue. Um, I couldn't see anyone between him and the stage. So uh, whether or not it was just a VIP concert for, for him, uh, I'm not sure. But yes, uh, avoiding the Chinese Grand Prix. I mean, it has been a minute. It's been so long, you've never spoken about the Chinese Grand Prix on this podcast. Not on this podcast, but in plenty of other places, that's for sure. And we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that in, in just a minute. Look, yeah, we hope that Campy's had a great weekend. I do feel sorry for whoever was standing behind him at the Incubus concert because they will not have been able to see yes. a single thing. Very um, good. But look, I just had to pull out a comment this week. Comment this weekend following mm. the um, Japan Grand Prix, and so, look, I think Formula One on social media is just not a great place, as we talk about mm. quite regularly. But every now yeah. and then, you do get these little glimmers of hilarity and people who are going about things with the right spirit. And there was a video of Leclerc discussing strategy during the the Japan Grand Prix. And someone commented on it saying, imagine driving at 250 k's an hour, modifying the car specs for each curb, fighting G-forces, feeling the tyre degradation to give feedback to your team in real time and also discussing a strategy by radio. These guys are super computers and super athletes. Mm. Most of the people cannot drive and most pe- most of the people... <laughs> capitals cannot drive and speak correctly at the same time lol to which somebody has replied and let's not forget in a language that is not your own true mm. to which somebody else said and here's me turning off the music while i park my car totally. and i just had to have such a laugh at that because it can be a really grim place out there when it comes to social media and mm. i just like to see those little lights where people are just going about things in a funny way Go to the Discord, tell me, is it just you or is it when you reach your 30s like I am in, when you arrive to be close to the destination that you turn the music down, somehow (laughs) turning the music down helps you see better? To see better, yes. Let me know. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe that's two of us. Uh, Go to the Discord channel and let me know because uh, I feel ridiculous doing that and other people in the car with me will go, why are you turning the music? Because I can see better. I can see better. What it's actually doing is helping your brain to focus on one thing at a time. So rather than it actually enhancing your vision, James, it's just... Uh, getting breathe. rid of the noise, basically. Cognitively, <laughs> you and I are not as able as these drivers. So. Thank, thank God. 
<laughs> exactly. Look, let's get on with news of this week. There has been a, has been a little bit going on. First of mm. all, we have it's been confirmed that Fernando Alonso is staying with Aston Martin. Now, in this announcement, he said that yes, I spoke to other teams, but ultimately, I felt the most wanted at Aston, which I find interesting. Mm. And he said it was also the logical choice. All the other conversations were light and never really reached conclusions or offers. He also added that Honda in 2026 was a big part of what he felt was appealing about Aston Martin, in addition to their obvious kind of investment in the team and the sport as a whole, obviously talking about um, their new fit out at, um, at Silverstone, the new wind tunnel that is coming and obviously a lot of money going into this team and it being a big priority for them. It is the longest contract that he's ever signed. So he'll race until 2026. Uh, but discussion, you know, in terms of his involvement with that team goes well beyond uh, his years as a driver. I think this is kind of where he s- sees himself, you know, spending mm. the rest of his days. What was your reaction when you heard this news? There's a couple of things to pull out of this. So he had a five-year contract at Ferrari. So when he says, he said this is the longest contract I've ever signed, mm. that to me is really interesting. So it's more than five years. That doesn't necessarily mean it's all racing for five years, as yeah. you said. So it at least takes him to 26. So that's that first part. Secondly, who would have ever thought that he would have been praising Honda? This is the man <laughs> who single-handedly destroyed the McLaren-Honda relationship. <laughs> Yeah. So far that they went to go and get Renault power units, which by that point was still not performing all that well. I mean, they were performing well and, and Red Bull have had some wins, but reliability was still an issue. Anyway, I was convinced, absolutely convinced that Fernando Alonso and Honda was not a pairing that would have existed into 2026 and beyond in the new set of regulations, but I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, the third point is where else was he going to go? Mm. Let, let us be very, very real about the driver market situation at the moment. I mean, Sergio Perez is doing enough to keep his seat at Red Bull, in my mind. But this time last year, he was also doing the same. So whether or not that still becomes the case at the end of this season, who knows? Uh, if Daniel is able to turn it around, I still think Christian has so much of that beautiful romantic idea in his head of a Daniel Max pairing again, that he will make that happen. Now... Hopium is one thing, and of course, the last couple of episodes, <laughs> uh, we have had very two distinct very si- uh, big sides of the argument either completely agree with us or think that we're absolute morons, and that's fine. But I, th- I still think that, to this point, Sergio's done enough to keep it. I'd love to see Daniel in that seat, of course. Who, who wouldn't? But Yuki's not going to that seat because yeah. every time someone talks to Christian or asks him a question about Yuki Tsunoda and Red Bull, the conversation always changes. So... That then means Yuki Tsunoda's hope of staying in Formula One because of Honda's relationship ultimately disappears in 2026. Because as soon as Honda depart RB, there is no, there's nothing keeping him to RB. Now, Liam Lawson absolutely deserves a seat. Whether that's mm. Danny Ricks next year or Yuki Tsunoda's next year, one of them should appear for this guy. He's exceptionally talented and I look forward to seeing him in the sport. But... Alonso, yet again, after the Alpine domino effect and then Oscar Piastri and all the, the rest of the nonsense, is the one that has caused this sudden hurry up to the whole driver market. Now, of course, Lewis Hamilton signed for Ferrari. Carlos Sainz sort of stepped out of the way. And everyone thought in the last couple of weeks that Carlos Sainz would be the Spaniard to make the first driver contract announcement for next season. Uh, we should have known that Fernando would have won up to him when given any opportunity. So that's on us for being stupid enough to think that. But I just think Mercedes is not an option. We, mm. We've discussed that Toto's going to wait for Kimi Antonelli to see whether or not he is successful enough. If he's not, he has drivers like Ocon, um, Gasly, a few others that he could put in a single year contract until Antonelli is ready. So not only is that seat really not that encouraging from a performance point of view, but you're only going to get one year of a contract. Carlos Sainz doesn't want that. Carlos Sainz maybe wants Red Bull, but again, he's going to have to wait for a very long time. And his stocks are the highest out of any driver right now. So, Eddie Jordan said he thinks that Aston Martin will have a double Spaniard lineup next year in Fernando Alonso and Carlos Sainz. And so, whether Stroll and the board can actually get to grips with their team and go, do you know what? How about we get rid of Lance 
go buy Alpine, even though Bruman, Bruno Famine said, said it's, it's not absolutely for not for sale. Yep. But it should be, <laughs> you idiot. Uh, gets rid of, it goes over there or something else. Aston Martin cannot be a proper contender for Formula One World Championship until they replace Lance Stroll. That's just it. Everyone, and this is not groundbreaking thought process. Literally no. everybody says it. People who know much more about Formula One uh, and much less about Formula One than me say it. So everyone's on the consens- consensus singing from the same song sheet. So I just wonder if, if it's that might be a possibility. Eddie said there's nothing firm, that, but he's heard some things in the paddock. Otherwise, Carlos is going to Sauber. He has to, he, he's going to go to Audi. He'll go there next year. It's going to be a shit fight for 12 months until they become a works team. And the other person who is currently in contract negotiations for the other seat in Sauber is Valtteri Bottas. So, and I just think that'll be a great pairing for Audi. It'd be a great pairing for this brand new set of, gen, this regulation change rather, and a new constructor coming into the sport. Um, but ultimately it means that he probably won't be towards the front for a very long time. So, it's frustrating, I think, for Carlos because suddenly Fernando making this decision so early has closed, ultimately closed the only door at Aston Martin, unless Aston Martin kick out Lance, which is highly unlikely. And it's just interesting because he's, I think, as far as I know, he's kind of the only driver out there. We don't know. A, he doesn't really have a contract, so to speak, in that we mm. don't know how he doesn't have a, a date on his head when it comes to when he will stop racing there because... You know, that's just not his relationship with the team for obvious reasons. So it's always this question mark over his head because we don't know what their commitment is to him um, and what what they're going to do to extend that. Like you said, when they're starting to really evolve their processes and their practices and their buildings and their wind tunnels and all of that type mm. of thing, it's the obvious last thing that's not going to align with the – development of everything else that they are doing and they're going to say all right guys <laughs> everything else is to an exceptional standard and there's one you know big thing that is not quite there yet and someone's going to have to have that conversation at some point you know but he's the only one yeah. we just don't know where he is and can i just say as well for fernando alonso i mean this is his last contract in formula one more than likely mm. it's his last so like lewis hamilton he's trying to find himself an organization that has a, a life post racing um, and McLaren to me isn't that like their focus on their road car brand just isn't what it is because mm. Zach Brown has entered every single form of motorsport he possibly can. Whereas Aston Martin also now has, I mean, it, it also has a Le Mans program. So the Valkyrie is coming in to work, and so there might be some opportunities for, for Fernando later on in his racing career to step out of again try and have a crack well he did he's already won Le Mans so he's two out of the three for the triple crown but there's there's more in that but also just being an Aston Martin brand ambassador you could do anything he wants for the rest of his life in the same way that Lewis Hamilton would do that as a Ferrari brand ambassador and I just think it's really clever I really do it's interesting you mentioned that actually because Lewis gave an interview where he was talking about retirement as an athlete um, and he was saying that whilst it's obviously not on the cards anytime soon, it is mm. something that he's thinking about. The reason being that his fellow elite athletes um, are people who we're talking Michael Jordan, we're talking yeah. Serena Williams, people who he <laughs> he discusses uh, life decisions with. But more <laughs> to the point um, – athletes who have, who have retired um, and they've said, you know, how did you feel about it afterwards, six months down the track, a year down the track? How did you feel about your retirement? And there was mixed answers in terms of I didn't prepare enough for it. Mm. Um, I over-prepared for it. It's well-known now challenge that we see with athletes' mental health following retirement, whether that's by choice or forced to retire via injury um, or just the, you know, not getting a place on a team, basically, not being selected for their various pursuit. And so it is interesting that you say that because I think it is something that both Alonzo and uh, Lewis are looking at in terms of going, look, it is going to be in the nearer future in mm. comparison to the rest of the drivers on the grid and wanting to make better decisions in some of their 
um, athletes in the past perhaps and being really underprepared for that change yep. and the next stage of their life. So, yeah, absolutely. That's something that he'll be thinking about in terms of where it takes him post-driving career. The other news this week is that the 2025 calendar is out. Uh, this will be the 75th anniversary of Formula One in terms of like FIA Formula One, which so I think we could see some exciting events next year at different tracks mm. and people celebrating that, which is something to look forward to. The calendar in terms of some of the major differences, it'll start two weeks later than it did this year. As I mentioned, Australia is confirmed as the season opener and then we go straight to China. Uh, which was interesting on our Discord. People have already booked their flights and accommodation yeah. for the Oz Grand Prix weekend, which is great to see. And look, so you should. You know, this year Absolutely. there were 132,106 people at race day and 452,055 over the course of the weekend. So, Ridiculous. yeah, get your accommodation and flights booked. Probably yeah. not a bad idea. Um, Hungary goes back to being the final race before the summer break. And we do still have that triple header at the end of the season uh, to cool. finish us off of Vegas, Qatar, and then Abu Dhabi. Uh, I really disagree vehemently with that element of the calendar. We can talk about that in a second. There will be six sprints, but those are not uh, confirmed just yet in terms of where they will be. James, was there anything on the calendar that surprised you? Not really. I'm glad that we finally uh, have Australia as the the opener. Uh, I would like to get a, a deal to like 2036 or 2037. Yeah. And I think as part of that is we get at least five rounds as the opener uh, in that new deal. So this will be one of that. I mean, I mean, we could be the opener for every round. It just uh, sorry, every season I should say. Uh, I think it makes a lot more sense for once. Um, to have Australia, China and Japan as the first three rounds makes fantastic sense. It's a logistical nightmare to come out to here. The amount of people also who flew out to Australia and then flew back to Europe and then flew mm. to Japan and then flew back to Europe and then flew to China is yep. ridiculous to me. Just, yep. I mean, stay in the time zone. Lots of people went have to Bali. Holiday. <laughs> that was an incorrect place to go, by the way, for this part of the world. There's many nicer <laughs> places. Um and then to, to you put don't Bahrain want to hang out in, in Saudi, Kuda in your days no, off. <laughs> absolutely not. I just go to the Gold Coast for the same type of vibes. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, well, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, then being joined together, then going to Miami. That's the random flyaway race before all of Europe and then Canada randomly yet right, again in, in the, the middle. middle. Yeah. Um, why it's would It's a tricky you? one with Canada, though, right? Because at the start and end of the year, you know, yeah. the temperatures there just absolutely plummet. You know, the end of the yep. year is not viable T at totally. all for them. And you've got to put Asia at the start of the year. So it's, yep. they're a bit of a tricky one. What do you do with I, them? Yeah, that's true. But I actually, I'm just looking at this calendar again. I actually really like it. I genuinely, mm. I think the way that it is spread out and the sort of pockets of the world that we're going to apart from Canada um, and Miami make a lot of sense. I mean, to go from Monza to Azerbaijan to Singapore, or at least that's all coming this direction, and then North America into South America, back to Vegas, and then, as you said, to Qatar, and then uh, Abu Dhabi is the finish. I mean, it probably makes the most sense of a calendar that we've seen for a long time. So whoever has had a hand in putting that together, well done. I think we're not quite there yet, but it certainly makes a lot more sense than this season and last season. I definitely agree with that. I just hate that triple header at the end because the time yep. zones are disgusting because yes. Vegas is obviously um, a night race and so we had that issue last year of people staying up. They're going to bed at 7 o'clock in the morning yeah. and then having to go over to the Qatar and Abu Dhabi with the two following weekends and just their bodies being all over the place. Their poor circadian rhythms trying to do their job and going, ah, yep. excuse me, sir, what is going on? Poor circadians. Um, that is something that uh, that worries me just because we've seen it before. And I think when they talked about it last year, a lot of the drivers did say we need to learn from this. Yeah. And that's one thing I think they could have done better. And it's not even about the drivers. It is about the physical Whole team, team. That, yeah. that turn up. I mean, we know, both you and I know people who had just completely quit Formula One altogether because they were so cooked. And I remember speaking to one of those people specifically after the triple header last year, and he was absolutely done. He just he had a tough year as it was, uh, but absolutely cooked afterwards. And I just think to end a season, I mean, I was exhausted just from working the one Grand Prix, let yeah. alone doing, you know, bloody 24 like most of these people. And I know there's some, some time off in the middle of the year, time off in inverted commas and a few other bits and pieces. But I just, it is very tough. And I hope that, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the HR departments and a lot of these teams and in Formula One itself have a, rot a rotating schedule and a roster by 
trying to give people a break from those sorts of, uh, sorts of things. And so not everyone will be doing three in a row, hopefully. You've made a note here that says Charles Leclerc ice cream. Yes. Now, I have He's not seen this. released an ice cream. We have not, I, I, I have not seen this. So we're going to pause the podcast. I'm going to watch it and then we're going to talk about it. <laughs> All right. Interesting. It's uh, – I don't really know what to say. <laughs> it's mm. ice cream. It. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, they thought that it's uncommon to eat ice cream and to feel bad about it. Um, the comments on this is also fascinating. Someone has said, do you come as a topping? Wow. Well, Joy Maria, interesting one. Charles keeping a plan B in case his appendix removal is denied. <laughs> but <laughs> Look, it's dele- just a bit of fun. Delicious. Just, do you know what though? <laughs> it's just not something that is a proper business idea for me, like ice cream. It just uh, it feels like someone's gone, do you know what we should do, Charles? We should start an ice cream company. And he's gone, I've got fuckloads of money. That's a great idea. Why and not? No business sense. Yeah, I just don't understand. Um, it was kind of like teased <laughs> a couple of weeks ago and I saw something about it on social media when oh, that doesn't seem... Legit, who would do that? Well, proved me wrong. So here they are, uh, the Leck Ice Cream Collection. The advertising, that don't watch the full-length video because it's woeful. Uh, <laughs> just go, it's terrible and really long. <laughs> the 60-second version is fine on Charles's Instagram. Interesting. All right. That was something I didn't, uh, didn't see coming. So fair play, Charles Leclerc. You're keeping us on our toes. Um, okay. The last point here is Andretti setting up a Silverstone facility. So mm. this is an interesting one. There's a comment under this saying, you know, a shed does not a team make, which I thought was uh, amusing to Tell think that to that, Benedin. <laughs> well, and also to think that that's what he's doing here. I was like, this is a hugely symbolic move uh, as well as one that will help with the practicalities. Um, were you shocked, surprised, completely unemotional. What was your general response and feelings, No, James? I laughed a little bit. I laughed <laughs> a little bit because uh, in nowhere of any of the press releases does it say what the facility is for. I have read so many articles to go, but wh- okay, I understand, but what do you do here? Yes, this yeah. is a facility. It's very important that we have a presence in the United Kingdom with our facility. I was like, it's okay, so it's near the campus. We've got a campus now, we've got a facility. It is, if you know Silverstone, it is literally opposite the entry to Silverstone in like a big, you know, the, the uh, industrial area. So it is, as Freya said, right up front close to Formula One is a bit of a symbolic thing. There is nothing worse, I think, than having to just really physically put yourself here to say no no we do deserve a place in this sport they shouldn't have to do that they absolutely deserve a place andretti is a great brand uh it is a it's a global fantastic entity that that has fantastic results across multiple skews of racing so why not uh, apart from the ridiculous reasons of from team principles and sharing money and all the rest of it uh anyway so i think it's a it's another step in a good direction for andretti but Formula One's already said no. So unless something changes for 2026, uh, who knows? But by, from my understanding, the Cadillac GM partnership is still a thing that they're willing to uh, sort of be involved with. Yeah, so they've said that the, it'll have manufacturing facilities. Facilities is facilities. the word today, by the yeah. way. Manufacturing facilities including patent, model, machine shops, ADM, electronics, R&D, and office, additional office and meeting facilities. Facilities, so but many for facilities. What, though? I understand you get a facility. all of this. You get a facility. They already Everyone make gets stuff. a facility. <laughs> They make stuff, thanks, Oprah. Make, they make stuff in the US already for their IndyCar team and everything else. Like, I just don't understand. Anyway, maybe it's Formula E. Uh, who knows? Look, I, yeah, and they did mention that it may help with their Formula E presence. I think it's symbolic, to be entirely honest. They quite mm. literally needed to put a, you know, a physical kind of stance um, in, in the UK to show that they're not going away more than anything else. They're like, ha-ha, you can't knock down my fort now. I will mm. be here until you let us in. Um, <laughs> but like you said, nothing is nothing's going to change anytime soon. We already know the outcome of that. And as we watch... Alpine uh, and the like at the moment trundling around, it is even more aggravating that one of the reasons uh, that has been discussed when it comes to Formula One management um, is that they <laughs> just keeps coming back, that they will gain more from Formula One than Formula One will gain, will gain yeah. from them. And it's just annoying. All right. That is the end of the news for this week. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back. 
And we're back and we are ready to discuss the Chinese Grand Prix. Now, the last time we were racing in China, here's a few things that, uh, just to, to jog your memory, what was mm. going on uh, when we were last here? Here are a few Please things that were going it. on. Uh, I'm good at that. Uh, <laughs> first of all, Vettel was at Ferrari at that point. Mm. Kvyat was at Toro Rosso. Toro Never Rosso forget. was... Toro Rosso. Yeah. <laughs> we had uh, Kimi Raikkonen at Alfa Romeo with Italian Jesus. Uh, we had Hulkenberg and DR at Renault. That was his, uh, he just left Red Bull yeah, the year before. First year. Yep. So, first year at Renault. Uh, Carlos Sainz was at McLaren uh, with Norris, who looked about 11 at the time. <laughs> uh, Gasly was at Red Bull. So, he'd obviously yet to propel himself into Campy's bin. He was still. <laughs> in one of the Red Bull seats at that point in time. We had Alain Prost waving the checkered flag at the end of that race, which was a beautiful moment. Um, Haas, <laughs> this always makes me laugh and I wish Canvey was here. Um, Haas at that point was actually Rich Energy Haas F1 oh team. My uh, gosh. And uh, Grosjean was one Oof. of their drivers before he made his move over to IndyCar. Uh, Racing Point was a thing. We had Kubica at Williams, and this was one of those weekends where Lewis got in there, and that is one of those things that hasn't changed because I still don't know where there is. Mm. So, James, are you excited to go back to Shanghai International Circuit, or have you just forgotten what it's all about? Mm, not really, if I'm perfectly <laughs> honest. There are better racetracks in the world than this. The first part of the track is really interesting, I think. The latter part of the track is pretty boring. Um, but, and I've said this heaps of times, Alex Albon in a Toro Rosso around here in 2019 uh, was one of his best drives, I think. So he can throw uh, opportunities for different teams up and down the grid to do interesting things. Uh, it was the 1000th Grand Prix as well the last time we went here. Um, and they had like a quarter capacity for the whole event. So that shows you how interesting Formula One in China was back then. But at least there's a home Grand Prix for Zhou Guan Yu. In his last season of Formula One, he finally gets <laughs> a home Grand Prix after being promised so many times. Uh, yeah, this is probably a circuit that I would be very happy to miss uh, from, a, from a season point of view, but it's clearly here to stay. It's been announced already for next year as the second round. So it will be interesting because we haven't seen any kind of Red Bull dominance at this circuit before. The last bit of tyre um, degradation information they had was from 2019, completely different um, cars as well. We haven't run these new ground effect cars on this circuit. So, look, there's plenty to go. Well, this is going to be interesting enough at least mm. where no one knows really what's going to happen. Uh, and, of course, because we've seen some reliability issues now for Red Bull, that does throw some kind of hope towards Ferrari maybe being able to get a result. But it would be... I think it would be difficult for anyone but Max Verstappen to win this Grand Prix yet again, but um, potentially in the way that this circuit is designed, Ferrari might actually have a little bit more pace here than what people would be expecting. But again, who knows? Yeah, look, the, so the circuit itself um, was actually designed to look like the Chinese symbol for, which means upwards. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Shang, which I thought was interesting. So from above, like from the air, so it looks great. So we should get some very beautiful aerial shots. That's something that you might appreciate uh, with your plane obsession. Yep. Um, and no. we, uh, I'm not sure we'll see a fly, but very not interesting. from the planes down. But <laughs> Everything to do with planes. <laughs> and like you said, though, those last, the second half of the race, it does get a bit meh. And I think because we have the straight line speed, kind of big gaps between the teams that have it and the teams that don't, I think that's where we will see quite a big split between the teams who perform well here and the others who just don't have a chance in hell really in catching them because their straight line speed is so poor. It is one mm. of the longest straights on the calendar. It's 1.2 Ks long. So it'll be interesting to see if that if the rest of the track allows people to catch up. But I do think that's something that's going to kind of, you know, separate the teams um, in terms of their straight line speed quite significantly. Um, we'll get to our actual predictions in a minute. You mentioned Ferrari might do quite well here. Is there anything else that you're hoping or expecting might happen this weekend? Or is just the fact that we've got so many drivers who haven't actually driven here and those mm. who have not for a very long time, even like yeah. Norris didn't make it through the whole race last time. He, uh, he retired. And so there's quite a few who've, either never driven here or never finished a race here. So it could be a bit of jeopardy, but what do you think might happen? When my eyes are totally on Daniel Ricciardo and this new chassis, to be perfectly honest. It's the only thing that I'm really interested in this weekend. 
Uh, hopefully, it's uh, it's something that helps him mentally get over the last couple of rounds. Uh, Christian was asked, I think, at some point in the last week, what he thinks of the situation. His response was, Daniel's a big boy. He knows how to get through this stuff. Uh, also... There's a long season to come. Yes, there yep. is many, many rounds. We still haven't reached a full start of like a 2015, 16 season yet because anyway, there's a whole whole bunch of things. But anyway, it's a. I think for that it'll be interesting. Hopefully he can get to grips with, with the car a little better. Um, but otherwise, not really. That sounds a bit boring, doesn't it? But <laughs> I, I, I honestly think there's the mid-pack is so tight. If Ferrari do well here, as Campy would say, Haas will do well here. So it is depending yet again on Lance Stroll, whether or not he finishes the race or not. And if he doesn't, that 10th position is, is up for grabs. And uh, I think that's probably the most contested position on the grid right now uh, because of the strength and dominance of the other teams. Unless the reliability issue happens, which of course, as we saw in Australia, opens up more point scoring positions for more teams. All right, we will be back after this break to look at our actual predictions for the next weekend. Let's start with Campy when we're looking at our predictions. He has mm. just sent them through from live the from Incubus. bin. <laughs> live from the bin. Uh, Campy has said his predictions for the Chinese Grand Prix, front row, Max and Oscar. That's new, Campy. You're a, an original, <laughs> original beanie you are. He's just going to keep saying it until yeah, it comes true. And he's like, happens. oh, see, I told like, you I'm, I'm a the prophet. prophet. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Good. Uh, his podium is Max Charles, Carlos, sorry, Max Carlos, and then Perez. Again, completely unoriginal. Tenth, uh, he has Russell. Okay, and Hamilton last. Oh my god! Interesting selections there, James. What have you got for us? Front row. I think front row will be Max and Carlos. I think. For podium, will probably, I mean, I'm kind of liking Carlos being on every podium he's ever been in, and he is quite literally, wait for it, hey, Bart, say the line, he is driving to survive in Formula One. <laughs> um, so I think he will be, I'd like to say he's going to be second. So I think Max first, Carlos second, uh, and I think Checo will be in third. I get the feeling that he'll have a bit of confidence, Checo, from a um, qualifying point of view, but from last round, I should say, but we'll yet to see where he's going to be at. Uh, tenth. Oh, this is, again, this is the hardest position, the hardest points paying position to think of. I'm going to say Hockenberg. If Ferrari's going to do well, then I think Ooh, okay. uh, Haas will probably get a point. Um, and last, I mean, take your Alpine pick, quite honestly, uh, Ocon. Ocon. All right. So to be clear, you've got the same uh, podium prediction as Campy then. So... Mm. Max, Unoriginal. Carlos, and Checo. So both of you need to... In that order, though, did he say that? He did. Oh, well. He did, yeah. And I, the other thing, and to be fair, I forgot... To, uh, did I forget to ask him this, or is you this going to be Campy's fault? Bold Sorry. Bold prediction. Bold prediction. Apologise, I didn't ask you, but you also didn't remember that we do this every weekend. Here's the bold so, prediction. James, Daniel yours? Ricciardo is going to beat Yuki Tsunoda in qualifying and in the race, because somehow he's going to magic dragon himself back into the Danny Rick that we all love. <laughs> Uh, yes, everyone on YouTube, oh, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're a moron. How did you get access to the paddock, etc.? They let anyone in these days. They do, clearly. Uh, well, I mean, me and Cap, you on the grid. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> this, obvious. Hang on. The supercars grid, let's the be super- very clear, <laughs> was not Formula <laughs> 1. <laughs> <laughs> Front row, Freya Brolsma. Okay, uh, hilariously is the one who is actually meant to have done prep for this is the one bit that I haven't done. So uh, my front row, I'm going to say Leclerc and Max. All that ice cream, giving him some power. Yeah, Mm. yeah. apparently low-calorie ice cream, which is bullshit, by the way. Eat the ice cream. It's just delicious. It's just exactly. Uh, My podium, I'm going to say... uh, Why didn't I think of this before? Okay, Mm. so I'm going to say Leclerc. Mm Mm-hmm. Max Checo. Okay, so basically the same thing, but with the with the ice cream connoisseur and maker. Somehow Perla. he might make a move on Max. I don't know. Mm, um, tenth? Just trying to be more interesting here. Uh, Fair enough. Tenth, I'm going to say Yuki. Okay. And, and bold then, prediction. Oh, sorry. La- last, yes, you're last, right. Last, uh, no, I think you're right with the Alpines. Um, or 
or is it going to be a steak driver? I'm going to say Joe. Yep, I think he's mm. going to be last at his home Grand Prix, home which is going to be Prix. absolutely devastating for him. I'm sorry, yeah. that was very cruel of me, but there we go. And my bold prediction, um, oh dear, um, bold prediction is that. Would you like me to give you a bold prediction? Because I've got no. a second one. Because it's that steak can... will have a decent pit stop. Rather than that's a okay. Bold well, prediction. that can be Campy's. That can be Campy's <laughs> bold prediction because okay. he didn't have one. Um, so he can have that and I'm going to say my bold prediction, both Williams into Q2. Wow. <laughs> both Williams not crashing, not damaging a <laughs> chassis for a weekend would be a bold prediction as well. Well, I think that's okay. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Got there eventually. I'm trying to come up with something new and different. It's hard these days when we just find, and we've obviously had our you know, lovely spectacle of, of mm. Carlos's win in Melbourne. But when the teams have settled into a pattern under these regulations, it is tricky to be, you know, spontaneous with your uh, or imaginative <laughs> with also, your predictions. There's also an element where we want to be entertaining on this podcast. We're not going to say exactly what we think is going to happen because that's was boring because everyone knows that. We just, you know, there's the off chance that something that we say comes off and profit status will be stolen away from one Thomas J. Camp. Um, yeah, if you listen to the exactly. podcast, you know that's exactly what we do. Exactly. And you can do it as well. You can do. Yes. You can go and give us your crazy predictions on our Discord. There is some phenomenal chat going on there, as always, as well as some gorgeous cats and dogs. Mm. Um, please keep all of those photos coming. We absolutely love to see it. There hasn't been as much food content this year as I might like, I'm mm. going to say, James. Bone well, to pick the- with you, Discord. Get cooking. There's uh, been no running content as far as I've been aware because I've muted that channel. Well, that's just you being ignorant <laughs> as opposed to it not Happy. existing. So, Happy to be you know. Happy to be ignorant. <laughs> Uh, there'll be plenty of that next week, uh, either dismal or overly elated um, with how that how that goes. Um, you can also let us know what your predictions are on Instagram as well. You can let us know via YouTube in the comments. Don't bother trying to talk to us on TikTok. We don't know what that is. Um, or you well, can just does. tell us how excellent we are and leave a review um, either on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Five Stars, or on YouTube as well. Fantasy League, James. I don't quite know what happened to my team last last weekend. Please let me know um, if you know how this works, by the way. I, Fantasy, I don't. D- not you, no. but just someone on the Discord. Tell me because <laughs> yeah. I don't want to read the rules. I don't have the time. I can't be bothered, but um, it is difficult to do this well. It's so hard. And like last week, my like my team was actually pretty good in terms of the standings and where, where everyone ended up. And somehow I dropped 76 places. And I was like, I Classic. do not know why this happened. Uh, so go and join our Fantasy League if you haven't already because we love your names as much as anything else. Like That's we, why we're like, here. We all know that Campy's only goal is to beat me and everything else he doesn't seem to care about. But my goal is to cry laugh at the names that people come up with. So that's why I do it. <laughs> why do you do Fantasy League, James? Uh, I only am there for the names uh, and to beat <laughs> yeah. Campy because early days in this podcast, he managed to have some pretty decent results against... Uh, both of well, Tommy and myself, but Who? now I have been, that's right, Voldemort, and I have now been crushing him. And he's like, oh, I don't care anymore. I, I got my win early days and uh, now I've just packed it up. That's Take why. Take your beanie off and tell it to me straight, Campy. I think you do care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, that is it for this week's episode, the reviewing, previewing, hasn't happened yet, previewing the Chinese Grand Prix. Thank you for joining me, James. I won't Mm. be there to uh, review this one with you. I will either be collapsed in a pavement in London somewhere or potentially enjoying a few lovely pints uh, Mm. in a pub somewhere. Well, good luck. Let's uh, Discord, let's get behind Freya, give her a good luck in the general chat channel. Don't do it in the running channel because I won't see it. (laughs) <laughs> Over and out. Just say it properly. That's my sign off. <laughs> Just say it properly. <laughs> Unbelievable. No, Don't I will stop not. triggering me. I will not. <laughs>